team. So I think we're going to start uh, because the problem is that we are almost 10 minutes late before the schedule. So Dr. Mushira going to time for 30 minutes for the session. So one more time, thank you for your, um, for your attention. Uh, this session, we're going to talk about um, basically uh, the local experience um, uh, um, uh, about antimicrobial stewardship. And certainly, I'd be more delighted to kind of share with you um, we had a question is, uh, do we have experience with antimicrobial stewardship? And, and certainly, yes, we do. And uh, uh, I'll be more than happy to share uh, our experience with uh, antimicrobial stewardship and the local recommendation. And basically, the whole focus is going to be where are we now and why and how have we reached that stage? Now, before I'm going to begin this talk, um, so for those who still have some problems in understanding exactly what do we mean by antimicrobial stewardship, and I think the best way to kind of explain that is by giving you a non-medical example. For example, the best way to describe antimicrobial stewardship uh, program is if you look into the airline industry. So now, no, let me explain that. Now, when you go to the airplane, you need a boarding bus, right? And you're going to go through the security check. And this is exactly what we do with antimicrobial stewardship by when you restrict an antibiotic, you need an approval. And to need an approval, we go through a checklist before we approve it. So that's example one. Again, you need a passport to go to the airline, right? So you need an antibiogram as well to kind of explain to you your local microbiology. Number three, when you're on the airplane, you're looking at the world from a high distant, thousand of feet. In antimicrobial social program, you, the, you, you, you kind of look at the overall use in the hospital of antibiotic consumption as well. The top priority in the airlines, that you cannot joke about it, is what? Safety, right? Antimicrobial social program is exactly the same thing. We care about the safety and the patient care as well. And the other last example, for God bidden, if there's an airline crash, then the whole team gonna sit and go through a systemic review, a checklist, to find out where was the problem. Guess what, in the antimicrobial social program, it's a team effort, but they set and they create a system checklist um, to kind of implement the, or promote the use of antibiotic. This is exactly what do, I, what do we mean by antimicrobial social program. Now, there's a nice book called Crossing the Quality Chasm, produced by the Institute of Medicine. And what they have said, um, is that if you want to implement a new program or a change process, you have to go, three, you have to go thr uh, through these phases. And I certainly, we went through it uh, back in 2011. In 2011, the current state was, I need to implement antimicrobial or to create, to begin with, an antimicrobial social program. It was too high for us to reach. It was a dream. So the first thing we went through is actually it cannot be done. It's impossible, cannot be done. Then we find the, the key people to help us in kind of talking about the importance of antimicrobial social. Then we kind of felt and experienced phase two, which is, well, it probably can be done, but you know what? It's not worth doing it. Why? Because compensation is an issue. We don't have the resources. I don't think that my superior is going to let me do an extra job for free as well. And guess what? In 2014, when you look at the result and the data, you know what we have said and we have experienced? We said, you know what? We have done it. We knew it was a good idea all along because we have seen the effect. So don't be scared from the, 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 uh, the, you know, um, the sound of antimicrobial stewardship. And trust me, if we did it, despite all the difficulties, I'm sure you guys can do it even in your hospital. So let me uh, take you through the steps. Those are uh, the team of the antimicrobial stewardship uh, program. So we have a clinical pharmacist, myself, an internist, and we have an excellent infection control uh, personnel, a data analyst, and we have an IT, which is not uh, present in the picture, and we have a microbiology as well. Those are the team. And those are the team who have trained with, with time and experience. And we kind of managed at least to kind of be at a stage that um, we can at least say, yes, we do have a program. And the whole focus from this was getting every patient on the right antibiotics. 
Now we had um, um, kind of a, a key successful factors to implement a change. A change process is a most difficult um, uh, process, but you need to have a clear goal. Why do you need to do it? I need to promote the antibiotic use, but why? It's for the safety of the patient. And we are going in, 2018, in 2018 in Bahrain by the national insurance. And one of the mandate things about the insurance is that you need to kind of publish your data about your local surveillance before they're going to let their patient come into your hospital. So that's a clear goal. Two, you really need to believe that you need to have a change. Don't say, I'm going to wait for the other guy going to do it. You need to do it yourself. You should have uh, a team that's going to work uh, in that process. Uh, I'm going to be a, a, a big liar if I say I have done it by myself. You need a key people to help you with that. And finally, you need to measure it. You need to kind of feel the success. You need to kind of encourage the other co-workers to kind of implement it as well. So the five goals from antimicrobial stewardship for the BDF hospital, we had very focused goals. We need to reduce antibiotic consumption and, and inappropriate use, and that's a major problem, I think, in, in the majority of the hospital. We have a problem with the C. diff rate when we start screening for them, because at, uh, at one point we, we felt, how, how come that we don't have a C. diff uh, in this hospital, despite the fact everyone can use antibiotic? Well, because we, we were not screening for them. We didn't have a measurement. The increased adherence, utilization of treatment guidelines, you need to create your own local guidelines that fits your hospital. Do not copy a guideline somewhere else and, and push it to your hospital. Study your, your, do the environmental scan and study your local problems. Reduce the adverse drug events. How many, how many times we have a problem with vancomycin side effect? Why people are afraid using gentamicin because of the dosing and the therapeutic narrowing index? Then you need to kind of be aware of those. And finally, decrease or limit the antibiotic resistance, which is a huge problem and um, everywhere. And I have to say, we had this problem um, 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 uh, as a kind of a killing um, feeling in every day that you're, seeing, that you're seeing in front of your eyes by working in the lab. This is the, this is the rate of, of carpipenemies is going up. This is, the, this is the rate of ESPL. So you kind of need to kind of stop that and have an action plan. For the, um, uh, let me just start with some basic um, uh, antimicrobial prescribing facts. And that's the uh, source uh, at the bottom. So one third of all hospital inpatient at any given time receive antibiotic through treatment. Up to one third to, one, uh, to 50 percent, they are inappropriate. I'm going to show you graph. I'm going to explain it why. Um, and up to 30 percent of all surgical prophylaxis, they're not appropriate. We do have that problem. Dining department, they might have their own prophylaxis compared to the orthopedic. And even from the same department, you're going to surprise that each different physician, they have their own prophylaxis. You know why? Because they come from a different school. They train somewhere else, and that's where they're going to place it. And that's a key problem. You need to make it a standardized. You need to kind of tell them, you know, we appreciate your effort there. Your knowledge is excellent. Uh, there's nothing wrong with your prophylaxis, but it's not going to work in my hospital based on local microbiology data. Antimicrobials account for upwards of 30% of hospital pharmacy budget. How many times do we, f do we face that when you want to introduce an antibiotic? The first thing they're going to tell us is that the budget problem can't introduce it. And we, we, can, we are accountable for this. We are accountable for the co constraining the budget. So why so many mistakes? Why are there so many problems? Well, based on the studies, high number and the complexity of the drugs make it a, a, a complex. There is, a, you know, patients get sick in hospital. They have this um, difficult uh, illness that needed a multiple um, kind of uh, antimicrobials. The poor training in antibiotic use, which is a kind of an unfortunate, starting from medical school as well. You know, our medical, uh, um, the undergraduate school, they're not trained about um, uh, antibiotic use. I hope we have a, a curriculum that, that they integrate uh, antimicrobial stewardship in the course. That would be a great idea. Start from the young generation and build up um, a strong foundation um, of physicians that they are willing, rather than waiting to kind of change their perspective and behavior, which is going to be very difficult. The variability over time and place, pathogen pref uh, uh, prevalence, you know, we have this open access, people come to Bahrain, leave, so we're going to have this mixture of uh, antibiotics, so that's why you have to do continuous surveillance. You know, don't do it just one time and just say, well, I'm happy, I've done it. Continuous. 
share the idea with our neighbors. That's uh, the whole aim from this conference. We need, we need to have an open access with the GCC countries. Tell us your problem, share your problem, teach us how, how can we manage it. And of course, we have to have an antibiotic formulations in your hospital. So this is a nice study um, kind of explaining where do things go wrong with antibiotic? Beautiful um, art um, study. So basically, the majority of them, so I can't use the pointer here, it's because the duration of the therapy are longer than needed. Is that correct? Yes. Now, we know with the, with the recent kind of literature reviews, we, we are coming down with the duration for VAB, with the UTI, with the community card pneumonia. It's no longer the 14 days and, you know, this long uh, day. So duration, kind of, it's kind of important in antimicrobial. How many times we treat non-infectious? You know, fever does not always mean infection. Look for other sources. Treatment colonization, treatment in the microbiology lab. Again, that's the role of the microbiology lab. We need to kind of be kind of advocate in terms of colonization and contamination, but they can't have that piece of information if there's no close relationship between them. The microbiologists in the lab will not, will not be able to know um, kind of, uh, oh, this patient is, is colonized uh, because he doesn't have the clinical details. And physicians need to kind of have this close relationship by calling them and discussing the case. Redundancy is a huge problem as well, accounts for 10% in the studies. Now, going back to my hospital, so when we kind of um, start looking at the local provider belief, and because as I say, if you want to use a change, you need to understand your local problems. So quite a few of them say the fear of error or missing something. This is a true statement in the United States, you know? I don't want to miss anything, that's why I give the antibiotic. Not believing with the culture data from the, microbi from the microbiology lab, and that's a huge problem. If you don't have the trust with the lab, then that's a very difficult relationship. And I, I think those two parties need to kind of work, uh, uh, work too close to each other. And this is when I say closing um, the quality chasm. You need to kind of um, um, reduce the gap in clinical variations by sitting and discussing. And you need to trust your lab as well. The other believe that patient is really sick, and they should have more antibiotic. Unfortunately, this is with the trainee and medical students. That's the, ha that's the whole kind of belief that they have. The myth of double coverage, again, it's a huge uh, a problem when they say, yes, double coverage has been used for this um, certain bug or certain disease, but again, you need to understand the curriculum. A right example I have, when I have um, in meningitis, vancomycin, and cetriaxone for every single patient. But you know what? Did you read the, the, the next sentence? Is if you have resistant, like pneumococcal strain to the penicillin, then add. Because you know, adding combination it can, it can be a problem. So do not just take one phrase and implement it. That's the key issue here. And finally, we got better on drug X, Y, Z. So you know what? Just continue both, uh, or continue all of them. And again, that's a true statement in meningitis when patients are on antibiotic, antiviral, antifungal, and you're just waiting, hoping for someone, some of the drugs gonna work. It doesn't work this way in 2015 anymore. So what are the factors that influence antimicrobial prescriber? Well, it's all nice, and when you want to sit with your colleagues, um, what are the problems? There are plenty of data can explain those, and this is one of the nice uh, article can explaining some factors can contribute to this problem. And I, and, and I divide it into inpatient, in outpatient. Now, we kind of focus on antimicrobial stewardship on inpatient, and we kind of forget about the majority of prescription happened as an outpatient. So one of the key factors here is the expectation of antibiotic. This is the society problem now. So we're talking about patients. Patients insist in prescribing the antibiotic. And if you don't prescribe the antibiotic, so you're labeled as bad physician. Because you don't give me the antibiotic because I want to kind of feel uh, kind of uh, uh, out of this uh, illness in one day, so give me the antibiotic. So again, that's misconception. And that, and that, and that we, we need to start by educating the society about the danger of uh, inappropriate antibiotic. Inpatient, I started with the medical college, medical schools, and we have here some representation from medical school. We really wish to have the curriculum integrated um, into the medical school right from that stage and build up a, a good generation of physicians that they are fully aware of the importance of this. Inpatients are more actually ill than complex. Again, that's a factor that we cannot change. 
the pressure to keep the length of stay, maybe we don't have these problems in the GCC, but certainly, you know, for the reimbursement, uh, uh, for um, kind of uh, uh, making sure that you are up to that certain amount of uh, budget to be kind of um, um, kind of receive from the agency. Again, that's a pressure to kind of um, uh, to kind of ma make it very difficult in prescribing the antibiotic. And of course, underestimate the downside to the inappropriate because we don't talk about all the side effect of inappropriate of uh, use of antibiotic. Again, many now literature support that. Uh, inappropriate use of antibiotic can increase mortality as well. Now, components of antimicrobial sewage program, extensive, nice, some of them are proven evidence based. Now, what about what Dilip said in his presentation? I can't fit all of this in my hospital, to be frank with you. So I need to kind of tailor it down to the reality. I need to understand how I can choose and pick from those sections and implement it in my hospital. And that's, I think, the key thing to start with. Now let me just show to you things that we have done um, in the BDF hospital um, regarding antimicrobial stewardship. Well, number one, we decided to kind of restrict antimicrobial. So we kind of um, integrate, um, 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 uh, kind of a, a, a list of antibiotics that need kind of um, 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 an approval from the ASM team um, if you go beyond three days uh, onwards. So, so, so kind of need a justification. Otherwise, the pharmacy will not kind of dispense this medication. And that comes along with the antibiotic order sheet for which, as Dilip says, we have it for three days validity that you can prescribe it. So we're respecting the autonomy. But then, after three days with any restricted antibiotic, you need to kind of call the ASM to review it. Now, I'm the only ID physician in the hospital, so I can do that by myself. So that's why you need a key people with you. So we have two other physicians that has been kind of trained um, in um, you know, the importance of antibiotic and internists, um, uh, basically, and they kind of helped, uh, helped along if I'm away or I'm too busy um, uh, in reviewing that. So that was an idea. And again, you can see from this um, kind of diagram where have specifically says diagnosis and the pathogen. So if you don't write the pathogen after three days, the pharmacy, and that's again a close relationship with the pharmacy, will not dispense the medication unless you fill that this is the, this is the bug and this is, this is why I, I, I give it. So we give them the prophylaxis, we give them the luxury of empiric or specific therapy. Then we implement the switch from IV to oral. Uh, we had just a huge problem. People believe on IV antibiotic uh, are more superior than oral. And a great, a great example comes with the, with the fluoroquinolones when it comes to the ciprofloxacin. For some reason, they believe that IV w works quicker, better than oral. And in fact, um, I don't have this data here, but um, in fact, we consume a lot of IV cipro and the budget goes really high up. And if you, if, you, if you apply the same amount of the consumption to oral, for example, you really can save a couple of thousand dinars, and you can just utilize that for such a nice uh, program. So again, uh, we can uh, lay that uh, in our handbook, which I'm going to show you later on, about when to switch therapy from, I, from uh, IV to oral. Number four, we believe that we should have our own local guidelines. Um, I can say, oh, use this rule because I've been trained uh, in Canada and this is going to work. No, you need, to, you need to have your environmental scan and you need to kind of study your, your, um, um, your problems and you need to sit with your colleagues. Because remember, you're going to have this conflict between other physicians. Like, why do you say you want to give this antibiotic? I've been trained. So you need to sit and come to an agreement. And that's what we did. It took us nine months, yes. But finally, in 2011, we produced uh, the antibiotic guidelines, which covers Treatment guidelines, 19 guidelines that's commonly we are seeing in the hospital, in the BDF. Antimicrobial dosage guidelines, uh, so to make sure that we don't underestimate the dose. Some guidelines for adverse event, how, how, how do you monitor vancomycin? As Dilip says, vancomycin is a great drug, but the problem, we are underdosing vancomycin. We go by the therapeutic index. It's red, it's 10, it's high. But it's not, this is not correct. So if you want to give it a higher dose, you can, but you need to kind of monitor it. And of course, dosing guidelines in the renal function is a huge problem. 
And finally, I think antibiogram was a key thing, which I'm going to show to you uh, in, the next slide, in, in the other slide. Now, I'll give you some example about some audits, local audits, that we have done in 2009 and 2011. This is before implementation anything. And you can, you can, you can see you know, the, the scary thing with the carpipenem consumption rate is way too far. Meropenem has been the drug for every single patient. Every single patient, fortunately. Um, um, uh, cephalosporin, ceftriaxone, has been the first drug for every single thing from the moment you come to the emergency department. Again, if you, if you don't see that, if you don't do the data, you're gonna, you, you're gonna miss it. So you, you, you kinda need to uncover that and look at the data. And that's a very scary data. So the cost, it's humongous as well. Um, so not only it's the side effect, the problem, the resistance, but even you can kind of argue with, the, with your superior and with your CEOs, it even the cons it's the cost of the, of the usage is, is quite high. So what have we done? So we said, well, we're going to stop this by implementing um, the antibiotic restriction and the, and the pre-authorization. And we have done that from 2012 until 2014. And you know what? It's not magic. It's not magic. And this is what we, what we did. So we were able to kind of bring the consumption rate to, kinda, uh, to a lower level. Not only that, we were able to switch from IV to an oral uh, uh, option as well. Number six, education, um, as uh, many people um, kind of believe in this, is very important. And we have done it in a different way. So we have done the antimicrobial awareness campaign for which we have uh, set and we wanted to, to kind of uh, um, uh, decrease the disagreement uh, along the antibiotic. Um, I was talking with Mark about uh, the program of antimicrobial solution in India, and over there they have a, a huge problems in kind of believing uh, in that system, and some people that just uh, throw kind of the policy away. So you need to kind of sit with them, educate them, reduce the gap and the differences. And the prescriber education had the same philosophy as well where you can sit with a smaller group, you interact with them, share their fear, share their, uh, uh, their belief, and try to come with an agreement. And what we show them during this education, it's some local, again, data. Let them, let them feel the fear, let them, um, let them see it. Uh, basically, apply the principle of 9-11, fear. Do fear, get what you want. So uh, again, that's what we did here. So the MDR rate goes up over the years, so that's a problem. Sorry. Uh, I think I have missing a slide here. Anyway, the, I have missing a slide. Um, the, the slide that I want to kind of show to you is that basically was about data collection about antibiotic consumption. Uh, next, uh, we, uh, what we have done then at a smaller scale is, uh, is actually going to a resident level. So engage them. So what we did, we said, what's the problem in this hospital, UTI? Then let's just do a project and kind of look at where is the problem and how. And most of the problem we have in my hospital is Foley's catheter-related UTI and the treatment of antibiotic. Then that's a problem. Redu uh, try to fix that problem by having a reminder system about Foley's. Why should it be for two weeks? People often go home by saying, oops, we forgot there's a Foley's catheter. Continue the Foley's catheter then. So reminder system kind of encourage you about knowing the indication. We start from medical school as well. Okay, I'm going to go fast then. So we, we went to the medical school as well. Uh, by doing a research about uh, uh, UTI and antibiotic pres uh, prescription. OPAT stewardship, again, that's another uh, element of, um, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, antimicrobial stewardship. So basically, it's uh, when you transit the patient from inpatient to the outpatient, and thus encourage the ID referrals. So before, in my hospital, there was no ID physician, so people don't refer cases to an ID. So for us to kind of engage them, you need to kind of control that referrals. So, and that was a nice idea to kind of take a concept from the, from the, from the OPAD and kind of encourage the referrals. 
and that can affect early discharge. You're going to make sure there's optimum dosage, improvement in the patient satisfaction, reduction in the nosocomial infection, and we have reduced the readmission rate uh, in 2013 by 12.6%. Again, this is when you measure the data and you show it. And that's just a few pictures of our OPAT clinic. Work closely with the microbiology lab. It's a key thing. Those are the team, and I thank them for their hard work that uh, they work with us. So basically, what, what's their role? They know they have the responsibility and the role. So they, they want to provide a specific cultural result. They want to make sure that the result is an accurate. Uh, we communicate with the physician if there's any, uh, if there's any doubt. So those, those go, this, this is all great engagement uh, between the lab and physician. Procalcitonin, as Dr. Uh, or Professor Iman talked about, Great, um, a great a marker. Utilize it then in your program as well. And so, and all, t uh, and all data proven that serial measurement can guide in discontinu and discontinuation of this therapy. And we are currently doing a local study where we can uh, look at that effect as well. So I'm going to skip that. Molecular rapid diagnostic. Again, talking about this, then that's a key, a key thing. C diff. C diff. When I ask my colleagues in Bahrain, what's the CDF rate in Bahrain? They say, we don't have a CDF. I, th I said, this is impossible. This is really impossible not to have a CDF. But having a rapid test that you can screen them and detect, I think that was a quite uh, impressive that you find that, yes, we do have CDF problem as well. So what are the local barriers that we found? Lack of understanding the problem. Time and effort, yes, that's a huge problem on us. We don't have a compensation. Uh, to kind of uh, to, to kind of pay for that, the fear of antagonizing the colleague, and that's a huge thing. So, what are our future activities for this antimicrobial stewardship program? I'm going to just end with that. I think one of the things that we can we, we are planning to do is by doing the antimicrobial stewardship clinical round, where we're going to visit once a week, um, the uh, you know the words and have chat. Uh, uh, and just look at some data and have this close uh, work with the, with the team and just kind of understand, you know, what is the problem and how can we help? Again, I think that would be an ideal thing. Active local physician champion. This is the thing that we really focus on. We need to kind of pick the champion so that he can transmit, he can relate the message to the core workers because you can do it by yourself. And targeted intervention, as Dilip says, you should, you should really focus on. And what we are going to target actually is, the, is the, um, at, um, um, at um, uh, nursing level now. So we have done uh, students so far. We have touched the residents. We talked to our um, colleagues. And I think even now, the nursing need to kind of understand what's their role in antimicrobial social program and antibiotic prescribing tutorials, if I might call it, for, uh, for uh, physicians. And by end, I would like to acknowledge uh, my great sincere thanks to the team for their effort from the infection control, from the microbiology, and from the ASM team. I, uh, I thank you very much for um, your hard work. And I conclude uh, by, uh, by saying is that my daughter uh, um, kind of often says to her uh, friends, my, our dad always says, antibiotic, don't overuse them or you will lose them. And I think that's even a key message to start with your own kids as well. Thank you very much. So we're going to just take a few questions. Um, uh, oh, we don't have time. Uh, just because I have to leave, so if there's any questions, otherwise we're going to continue with the next uh, session. Alex from Astri Medical Center. Um, I just love to hear your comment on this. Now we have done uh, great work and you have explained about the necessity of uh, you know, not overusing antibiotics by physicians. Now, can you comment on how much work companies does from promoting their antibiotics? You're speaking about producing antibiotics in hospitals which they dispense free antibiotics, free medicines. What about those person, 30 percent of hospitals or medical centers which actually gain their, you know, income from selling medicines, including right. antibiotics. So is, is your question is, how I can um, deal with companies sell their antibiotic physician to kind of prescribe? Actually, how could you implement a stewardship in hospitals which make profit by selling more antibiotics? 
which encourage actually... Oh, you know what? But this is misconception. You sell more antibiotic, you create a problem. So measure how much cost. Exactly, I'm aware of it. I just want you to comment on that. Right, please. and uh, again, uh, I don't want to say the figure in my hospital, but it's humongous. The cost is humongous. I'm talking about you now millions, millions in one year. So by showing that figure to them, you know, your leadership is going to say, oh, just go for it then, just do it. And they're going to support you. So you have to show them. As I say, you have to present your own data. I cannot say, use this because this is fancy program from, from UK or from Canada. You know, it might work there, but does it really work? I know it's going to work, but you, you need to kind of show it to them. Figure, data, money, yes. So you have to sell those to them as well, and you're going to have a successful program.